Well, hello, Emily. Thanks so much for joining the Dilly Dally podcast. And we're excited to have you here. And everyone, this is Emily Bibb, co-founder of Brief, an innovative way to bring brands and agencies together. And we're excited to hear your story and learn more about Brief and how you got there. Thanks, and I'm so excited to be here. I'm pumped. Amazing. Well, Emily, we always like to go back to the beginning of um, either where you knew you had this creative spark within you to go into an entrepreneurial path, um, also dive into a very creative field, especially with uh, working with brands and like merging creative agencies together in SEO and digital marketing. So let's go back to where it started for you. Where did you, what point or where did you know or what happened that like an entrepreneurial venture is in your future and a creative career is around the corner for you? Yeah. So I think I've always been an entrepreneur. Um, Funny enough, I was just um, back with my mom helping her move the other weekend. And I was going through all these boxes and I probably found about four kind of businesses that I had started. I was making t-shirts. I was selling potted flowers. I had a blog. So it's kind of always been, I think, in my DNA. Um, but when I really, you know, decided to take the leap for brief, I had been in the creative space. I was a marketer for over 10 years and outsourcing the way of marketing kind of boutique agencies was just on the scene and finding the right creatives for my projects was very, very timely and very difficult. And so, you know, it was something I kind of was going up against day in and day out. And finally I was like, I have to, I have to start this. I have to take the leap and, and why not now? So you're working as a marketer for over 10 years. What was like the biggest issue you saw? Was it finding the right agency for a specific project? Was it aligning on the budget? Was it just communicating what you needed as a marketer? Or was it, there's so many agencies out there. How do you know which one is best for you or which one has more hype and which one is actually going to drive success Yeah, or something else? I, I think kind of at the very foundation is over the last... 10 years, but I would even say five years, marketing has changed so much. Um, It's not like you just have one organic social media channel, kind of your billboard campaigns and away you you go. Um, As I was, you know, at these high growth startups, there was always a need for an influencer campaign or paid social or tapping into affiliate marketing or TikTok, you you kind of name it. And it was all, you know, initiatives that didn't really justify a full-time hire and were kind of experiential but needed a true expert to kind of take, take this over. Um, And so that's really where, you know, the search and the hunt for small agencies who are experts in their fields came in and it was taking a really, really, really long time. You know, sometimes I, one project took me up to three and a half months to find the perfect partner. And by that time, like the holiday campaign was basically here, missed a deadline, kind of away we go. So that's really where I think, it started was a shift in marketing, more channels always on, more need for support. Um, And that's what we we built with Brief. So you're working as a marketer. And then what was the day you said, I'm going to, I don't know if you're working like in-house or if you're part of an agency, but what was the moment you said, I'm going to start my own thing. I'm going to take this risk, run with it, you know, leave quote corporate life or agency life and, and build my own business. And what did that Uh, risk feel like for you? So one thing I've left out is I um, actually started brief with my husband, who George, who was my boyfriend at the time. And I was, you know, full time in house, kind of overseeing all digital and creative at a brand. He um, was running his own company, also running up against the same things. Hey, I I don't want to build up my marketing team, but I need the right kind of partners to, to help me take some of these initiatives to life. So this was almost like a dinner table discussion that we would have constantly. And, and he was leaning more and more into the idea. And I was like, Hey, I'm, I'm suffering these things too. Um, and so I mean, we were talking about it honestly all the time and we, we finally were like, okay, let's start seeing if there's something there. And it just spiraled from there, um, kind of dabbling on the weekends. And then it was taking up more and more of my time after hours. And then finally we're like, okay, there is something here. Let's just do it now. And um, everyone thought we were crazy. Like, how could you be working with your boyfriend and, and do all this? But um, we're now married and here we are. So it was not, it wasn't an overnight thing, but um, finally we just kind of dove right in, gave it our all. Mm-hmm. 
they always say when people are calling you quote crazy or how are you doing everything or why are you leaving such a stable lifestyle that it might be stable from the outside but you you feel within you there's like a risk that's coming with reward but also you have such a problem solution oriented business and both you and George saw it in your everyday marketing life and like and and business even if you're not in the, on the marketing team it's still holding back you know sales to product development finance and it affects everyone so I, I give you a lot of credit for saying hey there's a problem let's solve it and let's run with it yeah. And I think, I think that was the coolest thing is it wasn't even just a problem that we were having. It, it was a problem all my peers were having. So just talking to other marketers, George talking to other founders in his network, even myself talking to our payments team at, at the company I was at the time, <laughs> like, why are you spending so much money on these big agencies? So it, it kind of was, it wasn't like this siloed idea. It was the more and more we talked to people, the more and more we met actually our peers who were starting these smaller agencies it started to come to life and really form. And we're like, okay, there's, there's something here. So in terms of advice, we'll start with like a two part question. The first is, is there, has anyone ever given you an amazing advice of which you've always carried with you or there's a mentor in your life or someone who's just, you know, been a shoulder to lean on or someone who's kind of like lit that fire within you? Oh my gosh. First of all, there's so many, so many people. I, I think like what kind of inspires me and who have, who has inspired me with, with brief ha has truly been my, my peers, just building for them and kind of listening to them. I still get on calls with our clients. I still get on calls with our agencies, but building for their daily challenges, building tools that can allow them to create better work and connect with the right people has been, I think the, the main driver. I think looking back at my career, the funny, the funny thing is, is I've actually worked for a lot of married co-founders, mm -hmm. which I think somehow I've like manifested that, but just seeing, you know, how, um, the founders of pop sugar, they were kind of, that was my first job and how they've navigated and built a huge media brand. Um, that's always been really, really inspiring as, as a reference point too. Mm -hmm. And then if someone's coming up to you and said, Emily, I, maybe they're starting off in their career and they're like, I really want to start my own business, or maybe they're in their early thirties and they're like, okay, I have a solid decade under my belt of working in the corporate or agency lifestyle, but I still, I feel like I can be my own boss. I can run with it. There's a problem. I want a different lifestyle. I know I have that internal motivation. What advice would you give to them? so that they can dive into the same success as you and, and build their own um, amazing company. Yeah. Um, I mean, I always say go for it. I think what I fear more than failure is doing like doing something that I could have done or why not type of thing. Um, because you can always de back, default back to corporate life. You can always figure it out. But I think the first and foremost is kind of like, why not? But also just make sure that everything is set up and considered before you take this leap. Um, being an entrepreneur is by no means kind of an easy road, but, you know, making sure you have good product market fit, making sure you have a business plan in place, making sure you have various sources of revenue to kind of support you. Like I, I there was a time I was working three jobs, um, but making sure you kind of have it all in place and willing to believe in it more than anyone else is first and foremost, but always, always, always go for it. Cause you don't want to regret it 10 years down the line mm -hmm. that you didn't at least try. Mm -hmm. That is great advice. I think a lot of times people see it like in like, as Hollywood has changed, I feel like all of our opinions about romance to homes, to road trips, um, you know, careers, et cetera, they do glamorize the world of an entrepreneur sometimes like, I mean, less so than, than others, but there are those moments where you are working three jobs or maybe you're still working full time. And then at night you're building your own tech company or like you're launching your media channels, anything. It's a lot of work. And then you're trying to manage your social life and your health. You're still trying to get to yoga or go to your run club and build a business, but and still work maybe 40, 50 hours at your full time gig. So how did you balance everything, especially at the beginning? And now with like the growth of brief, I'm sure there's always a million things to balance. Like what, what is your advice there? Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't say I've mastered the whole balance part, but 
understanding that there's a lot of sacrifice and there's a lot of reward to do that is, is huge. And I think mastering the, the kind of mastering saying no is, is something I've, I've tried to almost become more of a no person than a yes person, because you, you can't do it all. You're going to burn out if you try to do it all. And just having your priorities straight. And that sometimes means not, you know, going on that uh, bachelorette party um, or that kind of sometimes means, yeah, saying, saying no to, to an event or two, but knowing what you're working towards and um, being able to kind of put in the hours when no one else is watching is, is so worth the, the mm -hmm. reward. Definitely. It's like having that North star of like, what are you working towards? And it's true. You can't say yes to everything. And I think a lot of people are learning that right now. And someone the other day on the podcast was defining the difference between no and boundaries. And I always thought of them as kind of similar things, but they said boundaries should, should always be there and your no, it might change based on your capacity at certain times. And it could be more of a gut reaction. It's different for everyone but they, they need to work in tandem with each other and what you say yes and no to, what are your commitments and what are your boundaries and what are your non-negotiables. And that is such a, a key part of that path to stay you know, in line with that North Star. Yeah. So it's tricky. And a good network too. I mean, I, I, I don't think you have to say no in a mean way, but I have, a, I have such a good group of people around me that they understand if I can't you know, travel to the long weekend and see them, they, they, they kind of get that, but they're, they're supporting me and, and believe in the bigger vision of what we're building as well. And that's been, that's been huge. And I'm really grateful for that. Mm -hmm. So what from your, you know, first decade working in marketing, especially like, I guess I should go back brief. We love it because it has amazing marketing behind it as a platform, both connecting with the clients and connecting with the agencies. And it's so fun and it's different. And you guys definitely are not rinse and repeating like so many other companies out there you have an individualistic point of view and your site is also so beautiful. It's so user-friendly and it's just fun. Like you want to sit on it all day. So how did you come up with the, the marketing idea and like kind of what was, what was the spark that said, this is the direction we want to go in and how do you continue to innovate across all the platforms and channels you market brief on? Yeah. I, first and foremost, it's being authentic. Um, I knew from day zero that if, Brief was going to attract the best marketers and the best creatives in the world. Our marketing had to be authentic and speaking to people who know the space. So that's first and foremost is being really, really authentic um, and being really relatable and kind of using a TikTok meme to touch on a challenge that a marketer might be facing um, or, you know, playing up the Met Gala in a way where um, it's still relatable to our audience. So kind of poking fun at, at you know, the marketers or agencies. Mm -hmm. But first and foremost is being really, really authentic because our users are very, very smart. Our users are creating the best marketing campaigns in the world. And so we have to be able to, to kind of walk, walk the walk with them. Mm -hmm. Has there been anything with Brief, whether in like the development stages or as you're growing and expanding the business, has there anything that's like shocked you the most or surprised you the most? I think kind of the, the shocking thing is like, you have to be very thoughtful with all kind of your flows and user journeys. Again, it's, it's not as simple as like getting an ad, signing up for an ad, going on a platform. But again, knowing that our user is um, very thoughtful, is trying to look for a long-term partner. The agency user is trying to find that brand that they will work with for one, two, three, four years being really, really thoughtful and intentional there. Um, and then, I mean, one kind of funny story that came to mind when you asked this question is, again, knowing your audience. Um, I remember back in the day, the first time when we turned on paid social, it's obviously all about finding an agency and the perfect agency. Um, but we ended up attracting a lot of musicians who thought um, we were offering agents. And so it was oh. so funny for <laughs> My whole team was like, turn off the ads. All we're getting are rappers who are looking. So knowing your audiences and like refining towards that and then knowing how to nurture them into what they need is mm -hmm. um, not surprising, but definitely takes a lot more thought than I think the ease it comes across on, mm -hmm. on social media. Mm -hmm. And paid social from like what everyone's talking about. It's just getting harder and harder. It's getting more complex than 10 years ago. It was a very much 
turn on, turn off. And now it's a constant management. It's like raising a newborn. You're with it all the time. And paid social now, you could have teams of 20 plus just on one single account because there's so many different channels, but it's also so competitive and with the complexities added with search and just the saturation of various industries, things like that, like they do happen, right? When it's like, oh, we're getting traffic, but maybe not from the right people. I think we've all been there. Yeah, kind of like, no, that's it's, really nice, but um, it's kind of like but, having yeah. the wrong people come to your party. You're like, I'm really excited for you to be here, but I'm I'm trying to find the right attendees. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. And I still think it is kind of wild how it very much is um, a bit of the wild, wild west. I mean, TikTok is something we're trying to, to crack right now. And um, every two weeks, I feel like they're launching something new or a new campaign to beta test. And so that's honestly why I really like it is it's it is it's never rinse and repeat with, with especially paid and um, trying to crack the next little audience or the next kind of little um, group on the internet is, is I think very fun and um, kind of part of the challenge that I enjoy. Mm-hmm. So have there ever been any risks that you, or I should say not risks, any mistakes that we, that are fortunate mistakes. So some people come on and they talk about mistakes and they said, if, Hey, if I went, if I were 18, I would take this route instead, or, that one career, that one job that knocked on my door at 25, I wish I didn't take it or maybe I wanted to take it or I wanted to move to a new city at a certain time in my life and I never took that opportunity. But I also believe that there are fortunate mistakes that at the time they felt they're frustrating, they're painful, there's a bit of a sting, but maybe six months to a few years later, you realize how fortunate of a mistake um, and, and what it brought to you and and how it kind of changed your life. So are there any fortunate mistakes that you have experienced throughout the years? I don't even know if I ever consider any anything a mistake. I mean, I would say, again, brief has not been an overnight success story. It wasn't like we woke up with, you know, 10,000 agencies on the platform and it was like, away we go. There were, I always call them like the basement days. There was a good year and a half where we were literally just trying to get our first agencies in the door and our first customers. And it felt super, super, super frustrating. And people were like, why aren't you innovating on the platform more? And why aren't you doing this? But that could have been viewed as a mistake. But I also look back and, and think because we were doing things so manually, because we were talking to every user, as painful as it was sometimes, it honestly allowed us to build better tools and better technology for our users as we started to scale. Um, so that that is, I mean, again, I don't know if anything is a mistake, but it, it definitely is some of the more like painful moments in your life when it's not clicking actually might be just the foundation to something a lot bigger than you could even imagine. Mm-hmm. Sometimes like, yeah, when you jump on a different path and it, it's true, especially when, in brief, you're not only trying to have like a sales channel to get the clients in the door, but you're also having a partnership program and you're bringing agencies. So there's, it's can be seen as a dual part quote sales channel. And I'm sure you're getting feedback from everyone. And, you know, it's, it, that, that can be very overwhelming too, when you're just at the end of the day, like I'm trying to run a business and trying to solve a problem, but you feel, I'm sure there's times where there's setbacks, but there, you look back later and you're saying, that's not a setback. It's actually something that helped me get on this new route or discovered something. Um, and it's kind of like just going off the course for a moment. And that's when you find the most innovative solutions. Yeah. I, I mean, a perfect example of that is, again, we started Brief to better connect brands and agencies. Simple as that. Couldn't find the right agency partners in our careers. But what we found out is that the entire process of finding an agency or an agency finding a a brand is so much more complex. There's the whole planning, scoping, budgeting, payments and contracts. And if we hadn't had done that manually for a better part of a year and a half, we wouldn't have realized that, okay, cool, let's reinvent the RFP process. Let's reinvent agency payments. That's, that's a, that was a huge pain point, just getting your payments. Huge. huge. Mm -hmm. So I, again, I think it's like a beautiful story to look back and, and be like it it's opened up a lot more doors versus just jumping in and saying, hey, I'm building like a, a matchmaking service, so to speak, mm-hmm. which is now mm-hmm. so much more than that. So share more about transforming the RFP process, because 
I think there's, it's interesting, especially within like the film video space and even within like digital marketing. And I've worked with various agencies for a long time too. There are some people that love the craft of sitting for hours, building a pitch deck. They go missing for a few weeks at a time. They're sitting in their office. To me, that just sounds painful. It sounds beyond painful. It sounds old school. It sounds like something someone should have done in the 1960s when there was way less like happening and you don't have email, Slack message, text message, WhatsApp, et cetera. And then the other part of the industry is 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 in line with brief and saying we need to we need to transform this RFP process. If we're pitching and there's only a low percentage, I mean, probably based on industry statistics, it's a low percentage of every pitch deck you submit what business you'll bring in. And so you need to bring in that constant revenue to keep your company afloat, to pay your people. But it's draining, it's time consuming. And a lot of times these companies are probably spending maybe five, four minutes on these on these decks and they're sitting in a room, they're going through it, maybe now they're over Zoom. But it seemed like such a waste and especially across every industry, we're looking to reduce waste, we're dream, trying to bring in efficiency. So I, when I saw the brief, was transforming that RFP process. I was like, someone is doing this now. Thank God, because this has been so in demand. And I would just love to know, learn more about that process and kind of how how you did it, who did it, because I'm in the camp of we need transformation. No one needs to sit for three weeks at a time to build a pitch deck anymore. That is in the past. No. Okay, so it it started. So I, within my 10 years of being a marketer, I was also on the agency side. Um, I kind of went from tech, moved to New York, joined an agency. Um, and uh, yeah, and looking back, that, that really was part of the foundation of Brief. And I will never forget one night, I stayed up till 2 a.m. pitching a client, very, very big client, like my dream client. And I had dropped all my other clients and just locked myself to your point in a room for two days, making this pitch deck, send the pitch deck out, never hear back. End up, you know, find two weeks later. Okay. We didn't win the project. And that just felt like such a waste of time when all we were just trying to do is have a conversation with the client. Like if we had had a conversation and been able to meet, who knows what it would have unlocked. And, um, and the fact that it was just, Again, I I dropped everything else. I I let go of of my priorities just to do this was so inefficient. And I think you hear that, you know, you hear agencies hiring one person to just focus on the pitch decks and and then never to hear back. And so with Brief, a, a very like critical business decision was make pitching easy, make it empower the agency to put their best foot forward, and then allow them to jump on an intro call with a client. And then that's where you can go through the details. That's where you can walk through the case studies decks. That's where you can really start to unpack it. But first Mm -hmm. make that human relationship, that human connection, and then dive deep into the weeds and save Mm -hmm. time as well. That open conversation too, because to your point, they might be more focused on what are the analytics behind your metrics and is this a a, a team we want to work with versus, hey, like what is your theory on branding and can you make everyone still look unique at the end of the day? So we probably don't need a 50 page pitch deck anymore. We need a conversation and then we can get into the weeds and save everyone time and energy. And that way people can really focus on the, in my opinion, more, more important things. And and that's building the business and becoming better at your craft um, and just opening new doors for everyone. Cause if the agency is better then the client's going to be better at the end of the day. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it, and it really does, especially for kind of these bigger projects it comes down to relationships. You want to you want to like the people you're working with day in and day out. Of course, you want them to be an expert, but you also want to like like make sure they align with your brand and your vision, and, and you all get along. And so, kind of bringing that forward and then putting the the details more after that first in, initial intro call has been, um, I think, a huge unlock for the industry. Mm-hmm, definitely. So another favorite question we love to ask, is there any place in your life where you feel you're sitting in the stands? And what this question means is that if you look back, pretend maybe you're at a sports game and you're sitting up there watching everyone and you're trying to tell the team, oh, you should actually, you should be running here. You should be passing the ball. And you're just, you're sitting, you're sitting in the audience, um, but you're not involved. So within your own life, are you sitting in the stands looking, saying, I wish I could start doing this something or maybe stop doing it. But what is that one thing that you've always said, 
I will do it. I will do it. And you put it on your to-do list and you wake up the next day and it's at the top, but you never get to it. Or you say, it's going to be my Sunday night project, or I'll do this over holiday break. But is there anything you feel like you're sitting in the stands? And if so, what is it and how are you going to accomplish it? Oh, that's a gosh, that's such a good question. I, I think as a founder, you're never really like sitting in the stands, but where you could be sitting in the stands is like, the evolution of everything. So it's, it's the business looks like the business in my day to day looks so different today that than it did two years ago, but constantly being able to like jump into something new. So one, I mean, one thing I'm just excited to, to dive into is like, how do we build out more content for our community? That's what I love to do, but that hasn't been, you know, a necessarily priority over the last two years as we've been building, building, building. So it is like diving into being like, okay, could, could we explore podcast opportunities? Could we dive a little bit more into AI and play with content in that side of things? I think it's it's just diving into maybe unlocks that I haven't had the opportunity to to do yet. Um, I don't know if that's like makes sense, but um, yeah, I think it's it's just not being kind of a passive viewer of 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 what's changing, but kind of being able to just like jump, jump on the train and go with it. Mm-hmm. So what's your hot take on AI? Do you think it's taking over the world? Do you think it's going to help everyone? Uh, is it going to affect agencies? Is there a certain type of agency you already see that it's um, like bringing a, the biggest change to, or even with your client space and the different verticals you work with? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we could ever, like everyone could talk about this for for days, but um, I've kind of boiled it down to is I think it's just going to unlock efficiencies. So either efficiencies in kind of the agencies creating work for um, their clients or clients and marketers being a little bit more efficient and maybe how they, you know, co- approach copy is, is an obvious one. Um, but I think it's uh, just like, just like any type of innovation, just unlocking efficiencies um, and kind of changes in workflows to allow, to allow maybe the marketer and the creative to, to, to do things they might not be able to focus on at the moment. Mm-hmm. It's true. We've seen so many efficiencies arrive, especially um, uh, just like having that brainstorming. Someone the other day was saying, um, yes, AI might be a little scary, but for example, if they're launching a new mascara in the past, they would sit for hours, they go on Pinterest, they go through magazines and they would pull swipe and build these mood boards and and change them. And, and it could take away so much of their precious time. But now they're able to find these quote, reference images, inspiration, focus points in just such a much more efficient, um, seamless way to get to that mood board, mood board point faster to then get to the product development and get it to market. And, you know, trends move quickly, like you were saying, especially with TikTok and what was trending six weeks ago might not be trending tomorrow. So yeah, there is, there is need for efficiencies. And you guys are dabbling in the AI space from what I saw as well, right? We are, we are. Right now, it definitely is about bringing efficiency to that content, just because content is king. And, you know, it used to be you need, you know, your pristine image for Facebook, and then your Instagram was cooler. And then all of a sudden, overnight, Instagram is pristine. And then you need your UGC for TikTok. And now you need your Reels. And what is Lemon 8? Or should we be on it? Are we supposed to still be on Facebook? Is Facebook only for marketplace? And oh my gosh, you have to write all these blogs and your SEO is taking over. And then your website, let's get down to your website because it's not only your direct to consumer, it's also Sephora, Alta, you name it. So there's so much to do. And even if you have a team of 10, which is pretty big for a beauty industry, um, even like a massive, massive brand for a team of 10 in marketing is almost unheard of um, because they're getting smaller and smaller. So we are dabbling in the space of AI, not to replace anyone's job, but to help people generate that content faster. And with AI, it's all about parameters. So branding is very much, you're, you're the brand police. You're saying, this is my image. This is my voice. And when your identity and your image can really merge, that's when you have a successful brand. So if you are scrolling through TikTok or Instagram, and you see something even without a brand logo on it, and you're able to say that's XYZ brand, then you know that image and identity has, you know, really come together in a strong path. So we are dabbling in it, but definitely still very, very early on, but it's exciting. Um, But it's a wild world, very much the wild west though. That's awesome. So as we wind down this podcast, uh, we like to go back to the past as well and into the future. 
when, let's say you were 18 and your 18 year old self is having a conversation with Emily today, what do you think 18 year old Emily would say to you now? Would she be surprised? Is this very expected? The path you, you chose and how you started brief? Like, what do you think she would say to you? Um, I think she would say, you're doing everything that you wanted to do. Um, but don't forget to slow down and just enjoy the ride as well. Um, because it goes really, really, really fast. It definitely does. It's flying by. It's crazy. Um, and then on this podcast, we love talking about career advice. It's something, whether you're starting off in your journey, you're 20, 21, you're, you're, graduating from college, maybe you're 25, you have a few years under your belt working in a corporate role, you're looking to make a pivot, you know, what's next for you? Maybe you are, you know, a decade in, you're saying I'm going to start something of my own. But what is the best career advice you would give to someone who is looking to make a pivot or is looking to like start this entrepreneurial venture? Like what is like one or two points of advice you wish you had early on that you could share with everyone? I would say leverage your network. Um, there's probably so many people in your career um, are kind of, you know, throughout your life who you've been in contact with, who can help you and who are willing to help you. Um, and then I think with that is just knowing to ask those people the right questions um, because there is a lot of, you know, unlocks that you can encounter just just asking asking questions and um knowing that you don't have to do it alone knowing that there are experts um and surrounding yourselves with experts because you can't do it all um I, I would say is kind of the the thing i would just recommend and share yeah building your network is everything and it's the people that you can connect with get advice from learn from and just like keep on chatting throughout the way and say hey can i throw this idea around and can i bounce them you know, different risks I'm looking to jump into. But and the world is so small. Like, you never, like, the people so I was working with um, 10 years ago are, are back in my life in some crazy way. Mm -hmm. And so it's so, so, so small. So also respect your network because you never know when they're going to come back. That is great advice because the world is smaller. This world is small. It's getting smaller. And that someone, they might be able to introduce you to someone. You might be able to introduce them to someone. You might learn from them. They might have a tool that you could use within your agency or business. Uh, you could get on a call with them for 15 minutes and sometimes sharing that advice. It can just change the entire game for you. And you yeah. know, sharing is caring and the world is small. Yeah. That is that's amazing. Well, Emily, you're doing amazing things with Brief. Um, personally, I am so, so grateful for Brief because it's just an amazing <laughs> platform. And not only from redefining the RFP process, but also helping clients discover agencies and agencies connect with clients and really bridge that gap. I think you're doing amazing things. So props to you and George. And we're excited to see how Brief evolves and um, give you so much credit for amazing marketing and building a beautiful platform that's so user-friendly and it's fun to sit on. So I encourage everyone to check out Brief. It's B-R-E-E-F.com. But Emily, where can people find you on, on social and more? Yeah. So um, on Instagram, I'm just Emily E. Bibb um, and on Twitter as well. Amazing. Well, thank you, Emily. It was great to connect and thank you for your amazing advice and sharing all your stories and we're excited to see what's next for you in brief and we'll continue to check out all the updates. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. And thanks for having me. Of course. Right, bye. Bye.